the history of silhouettes, the dunk is a forgotten stepchild that winds up being great. Athletes, skaters, punks, hip hop kids, the dunk was this democratic shoe. The dunk has sort of gone away, come back, gone away, come back. This is a shoe that's actually lived four different lives and one amazing journey. mid-80s was the last golden era of sports. It had set the stage for college basketball to be the most important form of college athletics. And the Final Four became one of the biggest sporting events in America. The scene is the 1985 NCAA Basketball Championships. It was the first time for the company having all four schools wearing Nike. The afternoon second semifinal game pits the nation's two top-ranked teams against each other, St. John's and Georgetown. That game featured 11 future NBA players, stars like Chris Mullin and Patrick Ewing. I was a fan of Patrick Ewing before he even got to the NBA. Georgetown was an all-black team, and you rarely saw a black coach. I think that captivated all of America. We all watched the Final Four in our living room, but in the arena, it was electric. There's nothing like young energy the way that they paint their faces and go crazy in the stands. There were Nike executives in the building. They were like, how can you roll that team mentality, that crew mentality into sneakers? They took what was happening in the stadiums, and then they took what was happening in their shoes, and then they put two records together and did a remix. Two weeks before the launch, Nike was literally pulling shoes off the production line to make changes. But in all that chaos, the dunk was born. The dunk, the most exciting shot in basketball. It basically is a Frankenstein of three of the best basketball shoes that Nike had at the time. The Legend, the Terminator, and the Jordan 1. Most of the shoes back in the 80s were white. They were very simplistic. The Dunk was one of the first shoes to color block, where you had big panels of the shoes that were blocked off in signature colors of the school that they represented. The result is a campaign called Be True to Your School. It featured apparel and dunks for 12 different schools. I'm pretty sure I ripped out that ad out of Sports Illustrated or something and like put it on my bedroom wall. The only way that I could come close to these heroes that I was looking up to was getting the shoes on their feet. I would have saved the money I can spend for back to school for the year for my dunks. Wasn't just basketball players out there hooping and dunks. It was kids that were going to games that wanted dunks because that was their school. Be true to your school went beyond just the original schools. I mean, take me for instance. I was at Xavier University in New Orleans, Louisiana. Our school colors were gold and black. There wasn't a dunk for our school. We were a small NAIA school. But that Iowa dunk, it wasn't Iowa dunks to us. It was Xavier. We felt like you had a shoe that was your own. The dunk didn't get the full justice that it deserved because Nike had this huge blockbuster on their hand with the Air Jordan 1. It totally eclipsed what the dunk could have been. In a concentrated way, the Jordan shoes dominate the market. And this simpler utilitarian dunk shoe, you kind of forget about it for a while. The dunk disappeared. It was like, I was gone, so what? Like next, Jordan 2, Jordan 3, Jordan 4. You would go hunt out at whatever bargain stores. They were in the bargain basement in a bin. There's a lot of similarities in what basketball players and what skateboarders need. Flatter soles, grip. They were made of leather, they looked like Jordans. All kids that were skating in New York were like, this is it. And that was the rebirth of the dunk. 
is a skateboarding shoe. Early 90s, New York City was this convergence of all these different subcultures that were wearing the dunks. These different outsiders that are shunned by society, but they find solace with each other. Having grown up in New York and being part of the hip hop scene, skateboarding, hardcore and punk rock, it was just this kind of all encompassing community. The dunk is kind of this canvas that they can all use in a different way. Back in the day, I remember you can go into Foot Locker and buy them for like 30 bucks. We would go to Models. They were in the bargain basement. Skaters were like, this is it. As a skateboarder, the dunk is functional because it's got a flat sole. The rubber on the sole grips perfectly. The shoe's pretty thin, so you can feel your board. And it just looks good. You get to the mid to late 90s, every single skate shoe company was making a shoe that looked like the Dunk. They would try to mimic it, but it would be very gimmicky. Nike, being the sports innovation company, they're gonna approach skateboarding the same way that they do anything else, which is, how can we come up with something new that's gonna check every single box that any skateboarder could possibly want? And unfortunately, there was a couple problems. Any big company coming in to a subculture, absolutely there was some mistrust. Industries solely built by skateboarders, so it's very like protective of itself. Don't let any outsiders in. Don't let it get taken over by corporations. There was doubt against them in that like super biased community of skateboarders. Skateboarders love to hate. And dude, they had a they had a shoe called the Chode. Chode. The Chode. <laughs> I think Nike could do better. <laughs> the shoes were overbuilt. Skaters were like, you don't get us, so we're not gonna drink the Kool-Aid. The activity of skateboarding went dark for years at Nike. This was at the same time that on the West Coast, there was a foot action, and they requested to do patent leather dunks. The guy that managed dunks for the West Coast listened to them, and eventually, he also started doing dunks in colors other than the original. Essentially running rogue, Nike footwear sales reps for the big box stores were like, what the hell are you guys doing? This is our shoe. The people that were making the crazy colored shoes were like, you guys can keep the regular dunk, and we're gonna do this other version of the shoe, and that's how the Dunk Pro B is born. I went over to Tokyo, I think it was 99, and I see this dunk, and the dunk's different than the dunks I'm used to. Crazy colors, crazy fabrics. It completely ties into the nature of skateboarding, which is creativity and customization. Skateboarding isn't like a traditional sport where you wear a uniform and everybody looks the same. The tricks you do, how you look doing them, what you're wearing, it's a sport of self-expression. These dunks were thicker, so they had more padding and they had a more padded tongue. The Pro B with the fat tongue, that whole innovation goes back to Ali Asha. Because Ali Asha, being a lifelong skateboarder, basically trying to enhance the performance element of what this shoe could be. So we were having a conversation about doing an alphanumeric Nike collaboration. And I was like, let's do a dunk, because we used to skate in those all the time. It was good. We're on top of the world. When a guy by the name of Sandy Bodecker finds out the current or former skateboarders are interested in dunks, instantly his ears prick up. In 2001, I'm working for a skate company in New York City. And one day, this guy Sandy Bodecker just popped up in the elevator and just introduced himself. And he was just like, hey, I'm Sandy from Nike. Oh, he had like bleach blonde hair, mad bracelets. I think he even had like a rat tail. He was going into skate retail, getting feedback from shop owners and trying to gain as much knowledge as he could. At first, I was a little surprised that Nike was looking at the skate community to support, but like, they really just did it right. Sandy did a really good job of listening to skateboarders. Sandy, he said, oh, skaters like the dunk. Why don't we just give them those? And at that point, Sandy instantly knows what it takes to launch Nike skateboarding. The first SBs that came out were the Colors By series, which was basically the Reese, the Gino, Richie, and Danny Supa. 
These weren't the biggest names in skateboarding, but these guys were the skaters' skater. When I saw the first four dunks that those guys had done, they were all pretty mind-blowing. You've got a shoe that no longer looks like a basketball shoe. It's got this fat tongue, the Zoom airbag in the sock liner. It's got colors that are off the wall. A lot of skaters were sponsored by other brands would take the sock liner, put them in their shoes and skate them. That's where Nike had the real advantage because they came in the game already with so much technology. I was like, damn, I wish I could skate in those, but I got a different shoe sponsor. And I had such FOMO. Those shoes essentially launched the brand. Nike rolled out the dunk by relationship building with skate shops. If you were a skateboarder, the backbone of your community was the skate shop. When I started working for Nike in 2002, the thinking behind the distribution was skate shops only. And it took some time for it to start to work. They like let a bunch of skaters kind of run a part of Nike. Nike was very selective on what shops were gonna be carrying dunks. It came down to one simple principle, supporting their local scene. And if they did in an authentic way, then we were down to do business with them. The immediate reaction was mixed. I think a lot of them, out of respect of what we were doing and the skaters we had involved, were willing to partner with us and try. And then there were a lot of stores that would call with, hey, I put a bunch of skateboards on the wall, sell me Nikes. And we're like, absolutely not, it's not real. If you know Darren, he can kind of shut you down pretty quick, which he did, like, didn't want to talk to us. They were just starting their store, so are they established? Are they going to be in business? The checklist of the stuff you have to do for the job we had. Nike was like, you and 12 other skate shops are the only people in the world that are going to be getting the dunk. The distribution was very selective, so it gave us an opportunity to stand out and compete against the bigger shops. The dunk is really special, and you guys are the only ones that have it that other store down the street that said you guys wouldn't last, they're never gonna have it. The shops were our social media. Skaters trusted them and they helped put that shoe out in front. Skateboarding was beginning to like peak as an industry. It was being manipulated a little bit, like just getting too big for its own good. The dunk kind of helped skateboarding get back to its roots. When I first saw that first four dunks and the group of guys they chose to put on the team, I felt like, yeah, they were coming correct. I was like, man, this is actually pretty cool. They're not just trying to come into the industry to take from it, but they also want to add to it. And I think that they were treating us like real professional athletes and like listening to skaters on product input. I had a hand in helping modify the dunk to make it a bit more skatable. I wanted to slim down the tongue. Nike was actually interested in working with me. When Nike came knocking, I didn't even realize I could dream that big for skateboarding. Here I am, little Mexican kid from the San Fernando Valley with my own signature shoe. This niche shoe, it now has a vehicle, which is skateboarding attached to it, which legitimizes the whole thing. And at the time, I remember a couple people telling me, why are you skating in those? You shouldn't be skating in them. That's when you started to notice. It was much more than a skate shoe. These dunks were creating this phenomenon. And we had other customers come in that weren't necessarily skateboarders. All of a sudden, like, New York area code's calling you. People started calling, trying to get a hold of us, and finding out my employees' names and getting gifts and all sorts of crazy stuff. We had kids flying in from other states. Seeing those kids spend like six days just outside camping, that was definitely a wake-up moment for us. I'd never experienced anything like this before. People were ready for the next thing, and collaborations is what was the next thing. By the early 2000s, Nike understood that the future was collaborations. And the dunk is a blank canvas. When you have all these different people that touch it and put a story to it, and that becomes the real transformation for the dunk. The 2002 Supreme Dunk Low, that set it off. They made a, a mix un peu improbable, Jordan skate, and they made the dunk, and we nous, nous parlait. So, from a point of view très sneaker, nous, cette collab, c'était just fou. Comme mis en place un espèce de standard. 
The Supreme was solidifying that market for store collaborations. The Supreme brand used to be sold out of Union, which is on the La Brea Corridor, which was this community of streetwear brands, Union, Stussy, and Undefeated. We all got offered the opportunity to do the Clerks Pack. The Clerks Pack was collaborations in three cities, LA, London, and San Francisco. Nike was giving the opportunity to people who actually interacts with the customer. The design, the dunk. The manager of all these different shops get to take a shoe and do our thing to it. I wanted something that was a good representation of San Francisco that had some history based in it. So I got to thinking about Alcatraz. We wanted to get black and white, which was classic prison colors. If you had carte blanche opportunity to do whatever you wanted to the shoe, what would you do with it? I was coming from this very sample collage way of making records and I wanted to kind of apply that idea to the sneaker. And so the shoe is the artwork from that record created by Futura. It's quite a collage of elements. You know, you've got embroidery, the paintings, is, it's been done as a negative of the original artwork. C'est plus qu'un qu'une chaussure en fait maintenant la dunk, c'est un moyen d'expression pour certaines personnes, c'est un moyen d'expression pour Nike aussi. Le travail de Bernard Buffet, qu'on le met sur une paire de sneakers qui est faite pour skater, je pense que c'est un vrai clin d'œil à, à Paris et, et à, à tout ce que Paris peut représenter dans l'art. Et la particularité de cette paire, c'est que bah en fait, chaque paire est différente. C'est un imprimé qui est sur du canvas. Bah à la découpe des empiècements, bah on n'aura jamais la même paire. The Paris Dunk and City Pack were awesome. There was these myths of other sneakers out there dropping in the world. A lot of Nike is very serious, like professional sports. But then you had this little thing that was more culture and like seeing how far we could push the edges, which led to doing a lobster shoe. When we started going through what Boston meant to the world, the lobster was the most obvious answer. We brought it to life, added the picnic print, added the metallic splatter. We knew that SB had told great stories, so we wanted to kind of follow along. We said that these blue lobsters were attacking the coast. They were eating dogs and ripping apart whales. Dude, that guy totally just went in the water. No, he was pulled oh in. <laughs> when you look at the time and the effort that goes into the packaging and the storytelling, it's just something that I've never seen before. With SB, we always were allowed to have fun. Partnering with creatives, artists, shop kids, people that were very much in tune to the creative side of streetwear, that becomes the modern day sneaker culture. The dunk threw kerosene on streetwear and helped make it more commercial. And when there's limited supply and lots of demand, people would get kind of crazy. You can't really understand where the dunk should be going until you understand where the dunk came from. The general public were not that into dunks. It was the connoisseurs, it was the trendsetters. Personalmente, I ero uh, ho, ho usato molto di più dunk, forse perché era anche più magari vicino al mio modo di essere, ecco, quindi più underground e più, diciamo, connesso alla musica. Il prim primo viaggio che ho fatto a New York è stato nel 91 e immediatamente con l'interesse comunque di portare in Italia sia sneaker che uh, brand streetwear. Most of it at the beginning was parallel buying from other countries and regions. You have this very small network of shops trading with each other because you can only get certain shoes in certain countries. I was buying two, three hundred pairs of them and sending them to Japan. Les Japonais que euh, touchés par la collectionnite aiguë. Donc je pense que euh, Nike Japon a su répondre à cette demande. The next big thing was a little program called Co.jp, which was the domain name for Nike Japan. And they would partner with key influencers throughout Japan and do special colorways for them and make 24 pairs, 12 pairs, and exclusively sell them in Japan. And the most famous Kodak JP is the Biotech, and that one was pig suede. Each panel of the shoe was a different color. The Biotech, people start realizing individually that the colors are so good, they actually really work together really well. Those shoes were instant hits. 
before Undefeated, there was Union. Eddie Cruz is still like working there. He had the Brazil dunk, and I was like, how do you have these? He tells me he brought them back from Japan. I was like, these will be valuable, which made me also want to start collecting more. <laughs> I think the Japanese perfected collector culture, understanding what the value of what shoes meant, whether in the moment or even long term. Les Japonais étaient les premiers un petit peu dans cet engouement euh, Internet et c'est les premières images qu'on pouvait voir de certaines dunks euh, Kojipe qui étaient plutôt rares. You had Nike Talk. It was the information highway as it pertained to sneakers. Rumors, leaked photos. You literally were just trying to make connections so you could trade and get access to shoes and bragging rights. Dunks are a luxury, aren't they? They are so alluring because they're not easy to catch. It was like, what, 32 pairs of the Wu-Tangs that were made. It was just like chasing Bigfoot. The Dunk High Supremes. It's so loud now that like, I don't want to wear it. I don't want to give it away. So it just kind of sits there in no man's land. With Grails, I usually always think of like the ones I had more of an emotional connection to. The MF Doom was amazing. The whole team was playing the album throughout the whole release. It was just a great moment. Moi, je stocke des paires surtout parce que chaque paire a une histoire, elle marque une, une époque et c'est cette idée de transmettre quelque chose comme nous quand on a ouvert la boutique et qu'on a fait un musée et puis même là, 20 ans après, quand des, quand des kids viennent dans la boutique et qu'ils voient un peu le musée qu'on a et qu'on peut leur raconter l'histoire de chaque paire ou leur... I might want to pass them down to my son because he sees some kicks that I have. He's like, yo, dad, I like those and I hold them down for him because everything always comes back full circle with the modern day shoes that we've done with the Grateful Dead, Ben and & Jerry's, and Travis Scott, now have made up popular culture. It's Dunk Madness. The Travis Scott, beautiful shoe. There isn't any other shoe that has like made its mark in all these different worlds. Travis Scott definitely brought new life and a new light to the Dunk with the new generation. If you're doing an SB and a dunk, and he's a superstar, that's a formula that's going to make a lot of hype around him. You know, rock him for a little bit, then skate him. If I can get two, I can skate one. And save yeah. it. Put one on the ice real quick, you talk. know what I mean? You got to yeah, save it. You got to save it. If it's some heat. You can wear it into the ground, or you can save it for something special. You can make it into whatever you want. The dunk can unite people who don't necessarily look alike, who don't come from the same neighborhoods, but have a love for the same thing. And maybe we could find some type of kinship through that. I think that was one of the things that brought all of us together. Just always being able to team up to do something. We all leaders, basically. The strength in numbers. Growing up in Chicago, we were just always freestyled. Music was a thing before people knew that we could rap. We rap the same money. We was one of the first groups to like knock down the neighborhood walls. Like we didn't care if you was from the west side, south side. We were just like the same type of kids doing the same type of stuff. Joey used to skateboard and Vic used to skateboard. The SBs was like the soul fashion skating shoe. That was one of the things that brought all of us together as kids. You might notice that somebody got a pair of shoes that you wanted when y'all both got them. Like you bond over stuff like that and then you create the environment where you create in the culture. A lot of us are heavily involved in activism, using our platform to just give back. Most of the South Side and the West Side are completely isolated areas where it's like, ain't no type of wealth for miles. It's literally kids with no shoes on their feet. We gave away 15,000 pairs of shoes in the same community. Even after giving all the shoes out, a couple people still kicked off their own shoes to give kids. We build back up our communities to try and create equity in the city. We got a bunch of initiatives, after school programs, summer camp. We're gonna be pulling together a bunch of learning activity books for kids that are affected by COVID. Our crew is doing some things for the power of good. See, the Dunk built relationships and crews came together to make an impact on that community, which became a part of your identity. We call ourselves Ghetto Gastro. We're a creative collective and we use food as a catalyst to tell stories. It's really about empowering our neighborhoods that we grew up in. I was first introduced to dunks as like an old school OGs in the hood that had a fresh dunk. 
the Bronx is a global melting pot of different cultures. But it's harder to find organic vegetables, fruits, every but there's corner. a liquor store in every corner. Bags of chips and soda, high fructose corn syrup, all of that leads to underlying health conditions. And that creates a powder keg for when the pandemic comes. Well, I like the vegetables. La Mirada is a mutual aid kitchen here in the Bronx, owned and operated by undocumented immigrants. The Bronx was the hardest hit borough by the pandemic. They were very passionate to use food as a weapon to help the community. Been working so hard, some of the guys have holes in their shoes. I was like, all right, we gotta get them some kicks. Nike did send out kicks for the La Mirada staff to make sure that everybody was right on their feet. We were able to get La Mirada working and then get these meals out to the communities. Community is a big part of what we're about here at Notra. Notra means ours, not just Jose and mine, but our community. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. And I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. MJ and I worked at Haberdash and clicked. One day, he pulled out the Michigan dunk. And we just went off on like a two hour conversation about dunks. After like late nights of work, we would hang out, grab a beer, and like work on our business plan for this shop that one day we would have. The dunk's why Notre exists today. And it brings great energy into the shop. We have people lined up just to sign up for the chance to win these shoes. We were like, what can we do with all this energy for the community, for the greater good? We had releases where we had people bring in canned food, used books that were then donated to Chicago public schools. I think it's not only meaningful for us, but also like our customers, they see the impact that they're also able to be a part of. This is our unit and the dunk is our shoe. Dunks represent unification of all these different ideas within skate, street art, design, fashion, and music into one crew. It's been a mirror of youth culture. The Dunks really just bringing all these people together in a beautiful way. If someone had it at school, they were the weirdo. Like, why the hell is this kid wearing a dunk? But I guess we're all weirdos now. The Dunk is an idea that everybody in the family said was going to fail. Because of that simple design, any culture could connect to this shoe and have some type of ownership. The hype might go up and down, but the dunk, it's forever. Legends never die. Thanks.